Hello, audience. Hello, speakers. Nice to have you. Happy Tuesday. Uh, the week is just beginning. I'm so excited about this uh, topic today. We are going to talk uh, why we need a pricing revolution in the B2B data world. That's a very exciting topic. And I'm so, so excited for you, audience. You're going to have so many good key takeaways. I was talking with the speakers backstage. It's going to be amazing. My name is Eduardo. I am a community events manager at Modern Sales Pros. And for those of you not familiar with MSB, we are the largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement, aka our modern sales pros. And we are here to create an environment for our members to answer the toughest revenue questions out there and to help them see around corners they might not know about. And we do that through live sessions like this one you're about to experience. We have a robust online forum where you can go and ask questions. And we also have quarterly summits. And finally, we are coming back to in-person events, which is very, very exciting. Um, if you're not already a part of the MSP community, you will be invited to join right after this event. And as I mentioned, we have quarterly summits and we just launched uh, our July summit. It's going to be uh, Camp Modern Sales Pros. It's going to be so exciting. I just dropped a link into the chat for your audience to go ahead and um, RSVP for the event because you can hear from uh, more than 15 uh, speakers from high caliber um, companies like Sales Loft, Outreach, Gensight, Stage 2 Capital, and much more. Don't miss out. Sign up for the summit right now. But that's enough about other events. Let's talk about this one. This event is being recorded. We, we cannot let all this knowledge from the CISU uh, executives here go into the ether. So we are recording the session and your audience will receive an email with the link for the recording right after the event. And also, I was talking with the speakers backstage, they love answering questions. So, uh, and this is a spicy topic. So you please use the chat or the Q&A uh, panel on your right hand side here, audience, to ask them all the questions that you want. And they will uh, answer, we'll make sure to get to them during this event. Um, and. The last thing for me, we at Modern Sales Pros, we have great partners. And today we have Sales Intel as partner for this event. And I have uh, James here with me. I have Manoj and Mike, they're all from uh, Sales Intel. And I also have Ariana. Ariana, if you can go into the chat and say hello to the audience. Ariana is here to answer all the questions that you have audience. If you have any specific questions about Sales Intel, let's go into the chat and say like, hey, Ariana, can you help me with this? There she is. She's saying hello to everyone. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to pass the mic to James. James, you can tell us a little bit about Sales Intel, introduce yourself, ask the panelists to introduce themselves, and then just kick things off. Great. Hey, thanks, Eduardo. And it's great to be back with the MSP community. Um, looking forward to today's discussion. Um, you'll learn about Sales Intel quite a bit in this discussion, so I'll I'll leave that to unfold as we go through the conversation today. We're here to talk about, as Eduardo mentioned, um, a pricing revolution. Really, really, this is a movement um, that we are really excited to unveil. Um, and this community is one of the first groups to hear about it. Um, it's relatively new. And in many ways, everyone, like, you know, it's, a, it's a, we're interrupting our normal broadcast for this important message, right? Um, I think many of you have heard us talk before. We always bring other companies, other speakers, different people from RevOps, sales, marketing, as you can see in the past. And, and certainly in June, uh, I'm going to be coming back on with the CEO of a, of, a, of a green startup to talk about lead quality. But today, right, um, we're going to do something that many of you might say or feel like is overtly commercial, right? But I would contend that this is probably the most important thought leadership conversation that we've ever had with this community, right? Um, because what we've heard loud and clear from all of you and from all of our other prospects and customers over the years is um, that there's been challenges in the B2B data world that have to do with how we price and how we contract. Um, and so we've listened and we want to share with this community um, essentially this movement around revolutionizing pricing, why it's needed and how it's really going to help. Today is going to be also different in that it's literally a 15 or 20 minute lightning talk with Q&A at the end, right? Um, so we're going to give you back some time probably, but um, that's all we need, right? Is a very focused discussion with you. So with that, I will have my fellow executives here at Sales Intel introduce themselves, starting with Manoj. 
Uh, thanks, Jim, and thanks to MSP community for uh, um, allowing us to host this webinar and uh, bring this really important topic for the go-to-market leaders. Uh, my name is Manoj Nani. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Sales Intel, and uh, I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Manoj. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike. I'm the CRO here at Sales Intel relatively new with the company. I've been here for just uh, two and a half, three months. So just getting my, uh, my feet wet here, but I've been in the data and intelligence space uh, literally forever. Um, I was one of the initial investors in the CRO for a company called Rain King. Um, prior to sales intels with another data centric business and now here running revenue again. So looking forward to the conversation today. Thanks for, thanks for joining. And of course, my, my name is James. I'm the CMO, right? And um, I have, over the uh, last couple decades, implemented probably 10 times, right, this type of uh, B2B data intelligence. So what you've got is you've got, you know, Minoj has been in this industry for decades, building data companies, right, to provide all of you this intelligence. Mike, who's sold it, right, and then myself in marketing. And that's, that's intentional, right, to have different personas um, representing this conversation for all of you. So in terms of the agenda, um, we're here to talk about the unlimited everything pricing revolution, right? We want to take a few minutes, Manoj is going to take a few minutes to explain how we got here, give you a little bit of a history of the industry. It's actually an interesting story, how these things evolve in the world of business, but it explains a lot about why we're at where we're at today, right? Um, we're then going to hand it to Mike, who's going to basically unfold or, or share the, the, what we mean by unlimited everything pricing, right? And what it means to you. And then we'll go through a couple of use cases, practical examples of, of how this new approach is going to really revolutionize how it is that you're able to use and get value from um, sales intelligence, from our, from our B2B sales intelligence. Um, and then we'll take questions at the end. We'll start with a couple of questions that are, we were getting all the time in the initial conversations we had but also Ariana is here to make sure we field and answer your questions today. Um, and then we'll let you go about your day and hopefully hear from you afterwards to talk about this in more detail one-on-one. -on -one. So without further ado, Manoj, I'm gonna hand it to you. And um, you know I'm controlling our slides here, so I'll follow along and it takes a, one or two seconds for the builds to occur, but take us through a little bit of a history lesson here. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, so, um, it's very important to understand the history of how the evolution of data industry um, occurred, especially in the B2B space and how we got to where we are and where we are heading, right? If you rewind the clock, even past 1990s, right? There were yellow pages and the business owners, they would get the copy of the yellow pages, the physical copy, and they will go to the directory to make the phone calls, right? Um, I'm sure we all have seen some of the movies where they hand the, the call book. Um, then in the 90s, uh, Vin Gupta, um, he started a company named Info USA. And um, there was not a lot of innovation, but what he saw was the world was moving towards digitization. And he literally shipped the Yellow Pages hard books to you know, India, to Philippines, to Mexico, you know, where the cost was lower to digitize them. And he digitized those on the floppy disk and then to um, uh, the CD and then brought them to the World Wide Web, right? So that's how the, the, the uh, industry started of B2B, the way, the way we see it today. And you know, DNB followed the suit, suit there. And the quality of data was a suspect, right, at the, at the best. Because imagine, um, you know, a yellow page is getting digitized over six months period of time, and six months later you get that. So your information is already a year old. Uh, and that's where um, salespeople were frustrated and two genius sales professionals, you know, Garth Moulton and uh, uh, Jim Fowler, they saw this as an opportunity. Both were salespeople. They were like, you know, why do we have to go hunt for this contact information everywhere? they came up with the brilliant idea of an active crowdsourcing model. They said, we all have some contact information of decision makers. How about we create a shared pool on the web where everyone comes in and contributes a business card and they get a credit. And in exchange of that, they can take 
card that they don't have. What a phenomenal idea, right? This is the pre-LinkedIn era. And that community took off, right? Every salesperson starting with the United States and then international started putting the information and then they, the community kind of thrived until people figured out how to game the system. Users started to put Mickey Mouse and take Mike Levy's information out. So the pawn started to get polluted. So that was the um, limitation of your active crowdsourcing model because you are relying on the participants of the network to actively contribute to provide the information in this, in this pool and keep that information up to date. So very few people started to um, contribute real information and fewer than them that it started to tag the information that was out of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, there's older information. Right around that time, I was working on the company prior to, to Sales Intel, Circleback, where we were working on the active passive crowdsourcing model, where we were solving the same contact data problem, but with a different lens. All our address books, in the business professions address book, they are getting out of date. And there's no easier way to come up with the uh, rate of change problem, to solve this rate of change. So the thought there was, everybody contributes passively their address book. We had, at that time, our own version of machine learning models, right, that will corroborate the data and push. And that solved two problems. One, we no longer have to rely on the members to actively go in and put one context at a time, right? And number two, you couldn't game the system because the information in your address book, there's no reason for you to put the wrong information, right? And LinkedIn came right around that. And then the industry started to started to take off. We at Circleback, we saw our business model was consumer focused. We saw there were two types of businesses, uh, companies that were trying to solve the problem. On one end, we had Discover Org, Rain King, um, that were focused purely on the quality, right? Very small databases. You know, started Mike uh, back in the days, 50,000. And I think at the end, it's got to about a million or so, uh, both Rain King and Discover Org companies before they, they merged. And then Zoom Info on the other end came with the higher quantity, but the lower quality, right? And all these companies, these you know, companies in both categories, they did, they did well. And along the way, you saw LinkedIn, network where we all go and self-report our data started to take off, right? And then private equity groups, they saw this as an opportunity. They saw the businesses, B2B companies, they need high quality data for the sales effort, but they at the same time need a high quantity of data and they can compromise on the quality a bit because to for a marketer, they could have a less than 90% accurate data as long as they can cast a wide net and reach a wider audience, right? Um, and over the period of time, the technology became uh, sophisticated. You know, LinkedIn network became larger, so you could now go and, and verify the information, like in case of Zoom Info. And you saw the private equity groups combine this, con they consolidated the market. Um, we, at the back end, being circle back, we powered most of these companies, right, on both ends of the spectrum. And about four years ago, we saw this as an opportunity five years ago. See, so, you know, this industry needs um, a viable solution. We can't have a monopoly. And just like us, other companies saw the value. But what some of the companies are missing, but they were missing the first party high quality data that was contributed um, through a legitimate source, right? Uh, and along the way, you saw the, the pricing models with Rain King and Discover Org where entire database was licensed for a single license fee and they charge per, per sales user license. Whereas Zoom Info and companies that had a higher quantity, they had a credit based model, right? So when the industry merged and the companies merged, the whole industry moved towards the credit based model, right? So hopefully that explains how we got to where we are. And there's, there are inefficiencies in that model that we have realized, right? From the 
go to market leaders from the sales leaders from the marketing leaders they now have to make hard decisions as to sh- how much data should we buy right should we pay for intelligence or not pay for intelligence well they don't know the answers for those questions um until they do the analysis of how big is their icp so some of those are some of the, the topics that we'll dive deeper into but hopefully this gives an idea paint a picture as to how we got to where we are in terms of the evolution of the data industry thanks manoj and um i think really you know this this slide here to finish out your your i guess your your history lesson um i mean this ultimately where we're at today is th- is this type of pricing p- per credit right where um we've moved away from the like you said the unlimited data model where every individual license is permissioned and sold and that license has access to whatever it needs um and so this is kind of what what things look like today right where we've landed today for almost everybody in the industry including sales intel until now right so mike um i guess take us through uh i guess the change the revolution that we're going through here yeah so i saw it as soon as i uh as soon as I landed here and um, on every uh, call that I was on, whether it was, you know, a call to assist on a renewal or an expansion, or if it was a new business conversation, there was an awful lot of um, back and forth regarding credits, right? It seemed like that is where the sticking point was in our negotiation. And um, it created a lot of inefficiencies, frankly, uh, for us and for our client. And then I started thinking back, you know, when we sold the, the ranking business to Discover Org, uh, that was back in late 2017, I had stepped out of the, the data, this type of data business. And I actually became a consumer of a bunch of different data platforms in my last business. And I started thinking about the way that we went to market and some of the struggles that we had and what would have been really helpful for us. And, um, you know, we put our heads together collectively and we essentially came up with this model. And so this saying unlimited everything, you know, it solves two purposes, you know, from a consumer perspective, you know, and again, I was a consumer of data for a long time. It solves a lot of problems that I had building my go-to-market operations. From us internally, it solves a lot of problems for us operationally, and it aligns us to where I believe the market is going. And we want to be a client-friendly provider And we want to have um, the ability to be a true partner with our clients and support their entire go-to-market operation through the life of our engagement with them, which is hopefully a long, long time. And so we came up with this unlimited everything uh, model that you're looking at here on the screen. And it really is unlimited. And what we mean by that is that there's no more credit-based subscriptions for us. Um, when you subscribe to, to, to sales Intel, you essentially have unlimited access to our data. Uh, you can download, hopefully import, um, your, our data into your, into your platforms, whether it's Salesforce or HubSpot or Marketo, whatever you're using. Um, you can, it's unlimited. So as you expand, as new opportunities ar- as arise, as your ICP changes, as it often does, we're there to support you. So, uh, and it's not just upfront, you know, you have the ability using our platform now, again, unlimited for us to append your data on an ongoing basis. Everybody, you know, on this call probably understands how volatile data is in internal systems, you know, depending on what you read, uh, turnover is, uh, you know, 20 to 40% annually. And so, you know, not only will we give you the ability to integrate our data into your platforms to help run your business at scale, but we're going to help you maintain that data on an ongoing basis. And that's really powerful. It's incredibly differentiated from everybody else in the marketplace. Um, We think that, again, it it positions us uh, as a true partner, which we want to be, and, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, James, uh, before the call, asked me to talk about, you know, the pricing model for this. And so I'll just kind of touch on it at a very high level. And if anybody has any questions, they can just, you know, ask. But the pricing model is scalable. Uh, It scales based on the size of your business. So it's not a one size fits all type of model. There's a base license fee. 
And then there's a per user fee on top of that. And so if it's a small company, great. We've got a model that will fit your needs again. And we're going to give you the data and intelligence and support you along your journey as you grow your business. And if it's a large or mid-sized organization, no problem. Our business scales to meet your needs as well. So anybody and everybody can participate. And the beauty here is in this model, the smaller companies that are just getting started with their go-to-market teams can now take advantage of the entire platform, right? They can have intelligence. They can have um, a contact data, company data, technographic data, right? News data. At the same time, they have all the modules that we have available. They no longer have to to wait to be larger, right? It's a catch-22. If you don't have enough data and intelligence, you can never grow your business. And if you can't grow your business, you can't afford that data, right? So our goal is to get these companies, smaller companies, out of those catch-22. Yeah, it's a very good point that we didn't actually mention here in this little graph, but it's not just the data, but it's also the technology that we provide. So Sales Intel provides a bunch of different technical modules. And, and so I think data is only as good as it is utilized. And so the beauty about the Sales Intel platform is that we've got the technology in these modules to surface up the right companies and the right buyers at the right times. And so it makes the data very actionable. That's all included in these subscriptions also. And that's a really big component and also a big differentiator between us and everybody else. Yeah, yeah and I think... Um... What I want to do is quickly go through use cases. I'm going to start on the marketing side and, and sort of dovetailing everyone off of what Mike said, right? Um, I go through the same thing in the marketing side as a partner to, to, to my CRO, in this case, Mike, going to market, where um, it's it was such a revelation for me as a marketer, the CMO, to be able to take advantage of the full breadth of data to go after my target market. Right. So if I'm a small company, somehow being limited to do that, as Manoj described, was really limiting. Of course, being here at Sales Intel, right, I had access to, to everything. And so what's really sort of profound is like, as Mike mentioned, is um, same, same thing on the marketing side. We're, we want all of our customers to have the same benefit and enjoy the same ideal um, state as I do, right, as the CMO of a data company. Because um, it really, when you think about targeting, defining, optimizing your ideal customer profile, um, you, you should not be limited on how you grow your business based on your data contract. Um, and the analogy here I'll give you is like, uh, think of your market as a box of crayons, right? Think of this as a $100 million or $200 million box of crayons. Um, and your data provider tells you, you can only go after the red ones. Sorry. Right. It's too expensive for you to actually go after all the other colors um, that doesn't work. Right. You may start off with a product fit and, a, and an ICP that's a red crayon, but you're going to quickly develop new features or you're going to want to test new segments or you're just going to want to be able to, to, to continuously message at some level this entire market, all the colors. Right. So um, I think, you know, it's it's a lighthearted way to explain the, the concept um, for all of you. Right. And then building on that is this notion of surfacing in markets account, accounts routinely. So we're all very comfortable now with the ABM, right? And the concept of intent information, right? But think about how intent really works at scale, right? You've got your ICP, which we just defined, and all those different colors, right? All those different segments, personas. You know, one in a hundred of those, or or maybe one in ten of those crayons, at any point in time, is going to be in market, and it's going to rotate continuously. This month, it's going to be you know, this ten million dollars of my market. Next month, it's going to be another ten million dollars of my market, and that the ability for us to surface that in the B two B data world has never been greater. But you need to be able to go after it. You need to have the flexibility in how you go to market, especially as a marketing team, to rotate through the data intelligence continuously, right? Because that who's in market is shifting all the time, right? And so this is also a really profound and important, um, I think, evolution, right, of how we want to do business. And, and, and so, you know, we've heard this before in ABM, but it's fish for their fish are, or I, I think um, Mike describes it internally over here as fishing in a stocked pond, right? If you're an AE or a BDR, 
nothing easier than pulling up to a stocked pond and throwing your pole in and pulling out a fish, right? That's what we want as a marketing team to be able to start to provide our sales counterparts, right? Or our BDR team is inbound leads or ABM leads that, um, you know, follow the fish, right? Use, use that capability. Um, and then of course we hand it off to our sales team. So everything I just described is really about the contact intelligence, about the news data, right? A new executive team, a new strategy, a new round of funding. It's about the intent data. And when you see intention to market, being able to bring all that data to bear. Now we get to handing it to our sales team, which is where Mike, you'll jump in here and talk about um, sort of how this impacts your work. Yeah, I read a stat somewhere, uh, somewhere along the way, uh, that 3% of your ICP is a buyer at any given point in time. And so, you know, as a sales organization, timing is, you know, incredibly important. And so you have to have uh, reach at scale and you have to be communicating with your, your marketplace at scale all the time um, so that when there is a problem, uh, when there when there's change management, um, you're you're top of mind, and so again, you know, using this model as a litmus, you know, it, it gives our clients the ability to do that. You know, they're not going to have to go back to the well. I mean, we're all trying to run a little leaner now, right? The the market in tech uh, has been hit for the first time since you know, two thousand nine, 10 ish, right? We've been on a, a heck of a run for about a dozen years, but it's not the case right now. And so, you know, we're running leaner. We're trying to do more with less. We all are. Um, you know, you don't have to go back to the well with us. Now you can use the data as you, as you want to expand your, your sales and marketing operations. You can AB test different marketplaces. Um, you can use our data, you know, to prospect into, different verticals, industries, et cetera. You don't have to worry about, you know, additional, additional pricing there. Um, the whole, the whole goal here is so that you can go faster. And so, you know, the analogy here is that you're driving, although that is a pretty souped up looking go-kart. <laughs> that thing looks pretty fast. It looks pretty fun actually, but it, it I'd rather be in the F1. <laughs> so, uh, but it's not as fast as an F1. So we, you know, we want to help you build a race car here and, and level up the sales organization. Cool. And we talked about the integrations, Mike, but this is, again, how you operate every day. And a lot of what the work you've done is like, how do you get the data into the hands of everyone who needs it? And why are you beholden to a monolithic stack or you know, talk about that a little bit, too, just to, to make that point? Yeah, I mean, listen, data, again, is only as good as it is actionable. And, um, you know, using our data, integrating it into whatever system you're using, whether it's, you know, Salesforce or Zoho HubSpot, Marketo, we want to be there and we want to help arm those platforms and also allow you to get a higher return on those investments, right? Because all of these different platforms that we're using are pretty expensive. Outreach, Sales Loft, you, you name it, right? These are all really expensive tools, but they're just that, they're tools. And so you have to have the right data uh, empowering those tools to get the highest efficiency, impact, bang for the buck, whatever you want to call it, out of that investment. And so no matter what it is, you know, we're there, we're going to integrate, we're going to append the data on an ongoing basis so that you get a higher return out of your investments across the board. And most importantly, you're empowering the sales team with actionable information along the way. And so, you know, again, just being a true partner, you know, yeah. to, and to the go to market. This analogy I love, it's, and, and Ariana who's listening and thought of this, but um, I think charging for every integration is a lot like how Apple and some of these electronics companies may every year, every time you bought a new electronic, you had to also pay for a new adapter. It's like you've already bought, right, the electronic, in this case, your sales cadence tool, your marketing automation platform, your CRM. You've already made a big investment. How is it that a company like ours then charges you even more, right, on top of that investment you've already made? It's similar to this concept of uh, Apple's fastest growing product category, which I think they finally solved that problem. So we're doing the same thing in the in the B2B data world, right? So Manoj, I want you to end up with um, on this last, this may be the most important um, 
comment or, or, or point here. It's a more, a more serious moment, right? I, I don't even know if people realize what might be happening in their EULAs for some of these companies. Yeah, I think there are two facets to this, uh, James. Uh, you know, we talked about the marketing persona. We talked about, you know, Mike and the sales, um, the revenue operations, right? Um, their job is to make sure the data in the revenue systems, the go-to-market systems are kept up to date. They have right information. They're enriched with the right information so that the sales and marketing teams can make the right decisions, right? And those systems are well integrated. Um, well, for that, you need data hygiene, you need data enrichment. Um, and what we saw, uh, industry stats are 2 to 3% of the data goes out of date. The contact data goes out of date every month, right? So um, CROs, CMOs, VPs of revenue operations, they budget that if they have a um, million contacts in their address book, you know, so-called address book, which is their, their CRM in a marketing system, um, 30% of them are going to go out of date. So they budget to pay for that 30%. Well, what started to happen during the pandemic, as well as this great resignation that followed that, 60% of the B2B professionals changed job. All of a sudden, all these companies were hit by huge bills that they had not budgeted, right? For the times, in, during the times, as tough as, as they are right now. Um, so, you know, one other thing that we are bringing here is unlimited enrichment in your in your CRM system, in your marketing system, in your sales cadence systems, right? Um, so you don't have to worry what happens if there's more than 30%. You don't have to worry about the budget, right? Um, second part is most of the data providers, when they give you data, you're licensing this data from there on basis that if the license terms expire, you can no longer use that data, but it's very hard. So think, think of an, an analogy of, uh, um, you know, you're, you're making bread and for that bread, you need flour, right? Once you have started making, using the flour and made the bread, which is your data and the CRM system and the marketing uh, uh, automation systems, it is impossible to get the data and destroy them. And that's the clause that you're signing. These are the types of clauses that you're signing with, the, with your current data providers. So the approach that we have taken is the data that you take from our system is your data, right? We would love to have the ongoing relationship, partnership for years to come, but for whatever reasons you decide that we are not the right partners, you don't have this data destroy clause right? that, that uh, you have today that you assigned to the other providers. Yeah. So we're gonna move to Q and A. Um, and uh, again, I know this uh, is a little different um, conversation that we normally have with the MSP community, but uh, you know, no apologies. This is so important. This is such a big step for this industry in this environment that um, you know we again, I, I think um, it may be one of the most important thought leadership initiatives that's come around in a long, long time. All right, and we're we're we're, we're um, we hope you participate in it, right? And there's always an opportunity to communicate with us, get a demo with us, but we wanna move at this point to, uh, to Q&A. And so Ariana and Eduardo, if you wanna come back on, I'm sure there's some questions out there. I've seen some things come in, so um, let's talk. No, absolutely. Thank you all so much uh, for all the information that you've passed in. Everyone that's listening in, please feel free to pop those questions into the Q&A and we'll go through as many as we can in the time we have remaining. Uh, so the first one I'd like to start off with is um, a question that we have here. Where does your data come from? I understand that some players collect their data from LinkedIn, but it's not clear how your data is different. Yeah, I, I can take this question. Um, you know, as I mentioned um, earlier in the, in the uh, pre presentation here in the webinar, that sales intel was built off of circle back was a predecessor of the of the sales intel where we have now over 14 million users they participate in our active passive crowdsourcing model to contribute data uh, to our pool we then have uh, our researchers that uh, clean the data so this data that gets collected gets processed through you know our ml models and then the researchers clean this data to make sure that when the go-to-market professionals are using it, they have the highest quality data available. So that's, you know, contact data. Our other data sets now, we own company data, 
technographic data, news data that comes from our exclusive partnership with our uh, um, partners in the industry, as well as some of the public sources and our research. Yeah, and I think Manoj, I think there is a difference in, I think people don't understand um, the difference between, you know, basically first party collection and proprietary uh, research versus basically just scraping LinkedIn, right? Um, I get that question a lot. I don't know if you want to explain what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, with the modern tools that are available, it's uh, easier to go and scrape any website, right? And, and build those emails um, the quality of data is not going to be there. And that data set, um, you know, so this is unethically acquired data, right? And at some point, it's going to go away. Right? It's yeah. like, you know, you build your house on somebody else's land. Um, you know, you, you, you can be assured that one day that the house is not going to be yours. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that explains it. I mean, people, I think, don't, um, when I talk to the market, everyone, that's a great question. Like, there's, there's differences in the data collection. You should ask that question. Make sure you understand where the data is really coming from. It's important. Cool. All right, Ariana. Um, thank you for that. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, so this is a question about the pricing model. User-based pricing. Uh, let's a company, uh, sorry, let's a company on board with 20 sales, marketing, or support staff actively using the product. Two years later, you're 1,000 employees, but only 50 active actively using the product at, at any one time. Do you charge for every employee or just active users? That's a, a good question. So uh, no, it's not every employee. Think about it as your go-to-market team, right? And so, uh, and there's a couple different user levels within that. And so first answer is we, we, we charge based, this, based on the size of your go-to-market team. But secondly, we charge, uh, we have a pricing model that takes it, um, into factor uh, direct users versus indirect users, people who benefit from the data. And the bottom line is, again, we're gonna build a model in, in that fits your budget and helps you scale your business you know, um, affordably. Yeah, I think that sums it up. Last chance for anyone else to jump in before we move on to the next question. All right. Next question that we have for you, gentlemen. Uh, I work at a marketing agency. How does this pricing model work for agencies? Are there any differences or limitations? Um, I'll take that one too. So yeah, there actually are. Um, so we actually have two different models, right? There's a model that was built specifically for um, companies that are using it on behalf of their business internally, and then companies who are using the data on behalf of other companies' businesses. And so if you think about marketing agencies, third-party marketing agencies, third-party uh, lead generation services, um, third-party um, third um, recruiting firms, staffing firms, right? They're big time consumers of data on behalf of other companies. Um, there's a completely separate uh, go-to-market model for those organizations, which, uh, which is actually not, it's a credit, it, that is a, still a credit-based model because again, they're using it on behalf of other organizations who could potentially be clients of ours. And so therefore there's a different pricing model, but for the traditional, you know, SAS or services, you know, uh, VAR, MSP, what, what have you, um, it's, it's the, uh, it's the unlimited model, which is, you know, probably 90% plus of our business. We do have a good partner program. We have a lot of great partners. And, and so, and as Mike mentioned, a lot of those partners will end up referring to, an end customer that wants access to unlimited. Um, and so um, for sure, reach out to us as an agency or, um, you know, a, a, a business doing work on behalf of many other companies because uh, we, we can definitely work with you and accommodate that. We do it all the time. Awesome, great answers. All right. Uh, oh, here's another one about the data itself. Uh, are you concerned about data theft? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> yes. I mean, of course we are. Um, but again, you know, I kind of said, you know, positioned it internally as, you know, you can't see, you know, you can't build a business and, and change your go-to-market model based on, you know, fear. 
And so we, we understand that there might be a few bad actors out there, but we also understand that there are thousands, tens of thousands of others that will benefit from this. And so we're, you know, much more focused on supporting the tens of thousands of clients that can use our data to scale effectively than a few bad actors who, um, you know, who could, uh, you know, do something nefarious. All right. Oh, and then another question in here for you all as well. Uh, what do you recommend for a single user uh, who's an insurance agent with a limited budget? So yeah, just, you know, contact us, uh, send us a note. We'd be happy to talk to you, walk you through the system. The first thing we need to do is figure out if there's a fit, if there's a business fit, do we have the data that you're looking for? Once we determine whether or not there's a business fit, we can build a model that meets your, you know, whatever your budget is. Pretty simple. Awesome. So it goes back to that modular model. <laughs> All right. Oh, and then here's an, another one that harkens back to the data destroy clause that you all have mentioned. Um, I've never heard of this. How, how do I know if this is an issue for me? Do you want me to take that one too? <laughs> uh, yeah, you cool. can or wh whoever. I yeah, know, so uh, I mean, James and you know, passionately. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I can answer it really quickly. So if you are using a data provider, um, that's not sales intel. Chances are that there's a data destroy contract, data destroy clause in your contract. And so what you want to do is you want to, you know, you want to re read the terms and conditions. Most of these companies, most of the people we compete with have the terms and conditions right online. And so, you know, read through the agreement. Uh, it's really, really important. You have to read your agreements, uh, but read your agreement. Um, and it's going to be listed in there, whether or not there's a data destroy clause. Also, you know, information around opt-outs or not opting, not opting out, whether they're going to notify you of an auto renewal. There's all types of, you know, gotchas in these agreements that you need to be aware of. But start with the agreement. Yeah. And, and you know, if you see that, the other thing is we are really have become extremely adept at helping companies work through that. Um, I mean, Mike, you know, you can talk about this a little bit more if you want, but I think probably five or six hundred times now we've encountered this, right? And we've been, a, we, we have a process by which we work with you ahead of the end of your contract with you with the other provider to make sure that, you know, we replace and replenish your CRM with the data you need so that you can comfortably make a switch well ahead of the end of that contract period. So when you do find that, know your end date and, and give yourself a little bit of time to work with, uh, you know, if, if you decide to, to talk to us, Give us a little bit of time and we'll help you through that process. A real important um, uh, step. And it's an area we've got a lot of expertise. Yeah, we're working through a bunch of them right now. But, you know, bottom line is we'll match any other. We'll match all the data that's come over from any competitor and we'll uh, update it in, in that process, which is also incredibly valuable. And then we'll give you back um, the clean data. And um, as uh, Manoj said earlier, you know, when we... Uh, when a client does business with us, we give them a license to use the data in perpetuity. And so we don't have that clawback. And so that's a real important safeguard for, for you and the business. All right, everyone, we're about to be done with Q&A. So please send in your more, uh, more of your questions as you have them. But we're going to keep, keep the show going. A very active chat today. Uh, what data sets are unlimited? All of them. Yeah. We so yeah. Sure you have, okay. We want to make sure you have unlimited intelligence, um, which means for firmographic data or technographic data. Um, news data. Or news data, right? We want to make sure that uh, uh, if you're large enough of a market, um, then you have access to all the decision makers within those markets. If you want, to if you are launching a newer product that caters to a different ICP. You no longer have to go back to the well, as Mike mentioned, right? You have access to that. And then I would say, re-emphasize again, the point you made at the end, Manoj, is the enrichment aspect. All of that same data can be leveraged and routinely enriched, right? Um, and that's really where I think um, your RevOps team, look, your RevOps team is often going to be concerned about a switch or concerned about some of the stuff we're talking about, right? But when you explain to that group of people that 
the enrichments unlimited, it is a massive um, relief for those for those professionals, right? Because they understand like the how how risky it is for the for their for your data to co commingle and then be subject to um, the, these data destroy clauses. So make that point again. All right. All right, it looks like we have time for just one more question under the wire. Um, you mentioned all features are included. I'm not sure what you mean. So maybe this is a difference between the data sets and how you search it, I think is what they're asking for. Yeah, it's about the platform features, I think, Manoj or Mike. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, the platforms in go-to-market go intelligence platforms have a couple modules. There are, there's a prospecting module, right? where you analyze your ICP, figure out who's in the market, and then find the, the decision maker's information. Those are three steps that go in uh, uh, prospecting. Then there's data enrichment. Pretty much every other company uh, in the market will charge you separately for your data enrichment. We don't. There's a visitor uh, intel you know, who's visiting your website. This is your first party intent data. The companies that just have business, the standalone business, but other go-to-market platforms, they will charge you for that. In our case, you don't have to pay anything. Everything comes as part of the platform that you're licensing. That's what we mean by unlimited software. Mm -hmm. Integrations as well, we've solved that bucket, obviously. That's correct. Yeah. No, no extra charge for integration. If you have yeah. Salesforce, Marketo, HubSpot, yeah. and uh, uh, Outreach, be our guest. Use for all four of our integrations. If you're using a homegrown software, no issues. We have APIs, and very soon we'll be releasing the webhook so you can develop your own integrations. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you gentlemen for answering all of our questions. I'm gonna invite Eduardo back to the stage so he can uh, wrap things up from us. Thanks everybody for listening and we look forward to uh, the revolution. <laughs> Me too, it's gonna to be a good one. Uh, yeah. Audience, thank you so much for your questions and for your participation. Speakers, that was a fantastic webinar. The knowledge you drop on us is amazing. Audience, you're going to receive a follow-up email with the recap of this amazing mm -hmm. session and the recording. Uh, we're going to wrap things up right here. But first, I want to say thank you to my speakers for the knowledge. I want to say thank you uh, to Ariana for helping me with the questions in here. Audience, thank you to You Are the Best Bar of MSP. Thank you for joining us today and for all your questions. Um, while the speakers and I hang out backstage, the Modern Sales Bros team will make sure that the uh, recording and key takeaways are available on our website pretty soon. And you will also receive a follow-up email. Um, and that is it, uh, speakers. We can go backstage and hang out for a little bit. Audience, I will see you in the next event that we have together. Thanks, everyone. That was amazing. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.